128, Grace Alone 128, our song of the month, and we'll let you stand on this one, 128, Grace Alone. <laughs> Sunday we do have a board meeting at 4.30 and so board members be aware of that this Sunday 4.30 and then uh, the 18th is going to be our children's activity so a little different from the schedule but we are going to have them come to the parsonage all right and uh, we're going to have some movies and games I think is the idea and so we'll uh, have some dinner for them as well so uh, make sure that uh, if you know kids to uh, let them know about that activity and we'll have that on Friday the 18th. Then the 26th is going to be our 714 prayer meeting. We challenge you to come out for that, uh, to pray for our Resurrection Sunday on the 27th. 
And we do have tracks in the back still, so I challenge you to bring those. And uh, also on that day, we're going to have a potluck, all right? So instead of the first Sunday of the month of April, we are going to move that to March 27th and uh, try to have more people stay. Hopefully that will be a draw to them as well. So uh, just like last year, bring double, and uh, we'll pray that double will come. And uh, so we're going to, Sunday I'll uh, have a different idea for you this year about outreach uh, for Easter. And so uh, I pray that you'll take the challenge on that. But I uh, challenge you to take those tracks and invite people and uh, tell them about it even now. April 3rd is going to be our cell going to be our revival. That's going to be here before you know it. Things are just going to go boom, boom, boom. And uh, revival is going to be here. We're going to have evangelist Eric Getch with us. And uh, you'll want to invite people to that as well. But uh, more details on that to come. But have that in your mind the 10th through the 13th. And uh, we will have a great time on those nights as well. Ladies meeting sign-up sheet is in the back. So ladies, if you haven't already, go ahead and sign up with that. If you do, tell my wife. Uh, so that she can plan with that. But as of right now, for the ladies' retreat, it will be $86 total. That's $25 registration fee, and then $61 for hotel. All right, and so that is uh, the idea there. And so if you have questions with that, you can ask my wife about that as well. And then the love and respect sign-up sheet is in the back. Those are some of our announcements. Remember, uh, Saturday door-to-door -door and then Tuesday visitation as normal. So it looks like Sunday, March 13th, that's his Sunday, Lord willing, uh, the other time. So uh, 12, 15 to 1, 30 if I don't go long like I did last Sunday. All right, so that's the idea. But um, uh, if you're able to do that, that'd be great. Free will offering, and this goes to help the Leisure Center. And uh, that's, that's a great place, um, isn't it? And they uh, promote the Word of God and such. And so we need a bulletin from Sunday. All right. All right. Any prayer requests? Uh, could you put my sister on there, Becky Martin? She's going to have a heart procedure next Tuesday. Something about freezing part of the heart or something and try to get it rhythm some kind of a technique they're doing. <coughs> Everything else has failed. So. Mm. Did you say next Monday? Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay, that's Becky, Steve's sister, having a heart procedure next Tuesday. So pray for her, Becky. Any others, Ms. Teresa? I think I saw your hand. Yeah. Um, I've got an appointment Tuesday. I don't know what's going on with my leg, but it's just really weird. Okay, so Miss Teresa has an appointment on Tuesday for her leg. Should pray for Miss Colleen. I got a phrase down there under health concerns in order. The girl that's having all the seizures. Yes. They diagnosed the problem and got her on. Tails beside is Hannah Warner, and uh, things are <coughs> figured out with her. So that's a praise. Any other requests? Yes, Miss Pam. Good. So uh, Miss Beverly's knee came back with no infection, right? So um, that's good. Pray for her recovery, Miss Beverly. Uh, my daughter-in-law, Allie Mays, down here in the baby section. She yes. is so sick, just baby sick. Oh, but the baby's absolutely fine, but. Uh, Allie's in the hospital about a half a day, so they can kind of pump her up on fluids and mm. stuff. She's she's working a little. Pray for her, Allie Mays. Any others? All right. Remember our um, Resurrection Sunday coming up. Pray for people who will be invited, and uh, that they will come, and if they're not saved, be saved. All right. 
we'll keep praying for that. All right, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer then.
once again. We thank you for being able to come to your house. Just pray that you would be with us tonight as we continue to look at the Back to the Basics series, that you would help us to understand this basic issue of sin, oversee each and every one of them, and Lord, that you would answer them in your timing and in your will. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and turn to our last song, 305. 305, as we stand together, burdens are lifted at Calvary. 305, as we stand.
on homardiology, and we said homardiology is the study of what? Sin. All right, good. The study of sin is what we are looking at, and uh, that word homardios means to miss the mark, all right? And so in essence, that's what we are looking at, seeing how we have missed the mark according to God's holiness and glory. And uh, so last week we looked at some introductory remarks, uh, seeing several different items about sin, and really understanding that sin is a global problem. Something that we have in common with every single human being is that we have all sinned. And uh, so we saw how that, uh, because of that, a lot of times society tries to gauge where morality is, but we understand we have to gauge it by the Word of God. Uh, a lot of times morals will change throughout the years, and we pointed out the fact that the 1940s is a lot different than 2016, and uh, morals have changed, and that we see that God's Word has not changed, and so it is to be a constant in the believer's life. And uh, so we saw sin defined as several different things, and we left off with sources of sin and uh, sources in certain different things. And so we saw Satan as the father of lies. We looked at man's heart. And uh, so we understand that man's heart is deceitful above all things. Desperately wicked who can know it. And uh, a lot of the things that happen in our heart eventually come out in our life. As we said, a man, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And uh, so we're going to continue with that thought tonight with looking at Adam's transgression. So if you would take your Bibles, go to uh, James 1.15. James 1.15 is where we will start out. As I said, we'll look at several passages throughout this study of sin. So you'll be turning in your Bible a lot, but uh, understanding where some of these things are found in the Word of God. Adam's transgression, James 1.15. As you're turning there, you're going to notice that we can take this formula for sin and plug it in back to the garden where Adam and Eve fell. And uh, so we look at James 1.15 and we see the Bible says this, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Lust will begin when we have the different areas of life go through our mind. So we said Satan will tempt us with the lusts of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So he does that through the eye gate, the ear gate, the mouth, uh, the nose at times for gluttony, right? And uh, all of these different areas. That's how lust is going to conceive because we still have the flesh. And so with that, lust oftentimes will begin in the heart, won't it? It will begin in the mind. It will take seed there of what we've seen, of what we've heard, and then it will eventually go into an action of sin. Now, when we talked about this last week, we saw that how that the book of Proverbs says that the thought of foolishness is what? Sin, right? The thought of foolishness is sin. The question is, can you have thoughts that are sinful, even though they're not outward manifestly, but inward, it can be sin, right? Oftentimes we sin here before we sin out here. Agreed on that? Uh, and I want you to see how that possibly, this is how Adam and Eve happened, and you look to the Word of God and find this in Genesis chapter number 3, and uh, there was something that went on in the heart and the mind of Eve before she reached for that fruit. And uh, you're going to see this here in the Word of God in Genesis 3.1. That lust conceived, and it brought forth sin. And uh, we call this the original sin, the first sin of mankind. And this is in Genesis 3 and verses 1 through 6. It says this, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. He said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. 
The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know in the day ye eat thereof. Then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now keep this next part in mind. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Put this in the equation, verse number 6. And when the woman did what? Saw. Saw. <coughs> through the eye gate, right? Saw that the tree was good for food. And it was pleasant to the eyes, once again, through the flesh. And a tree desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. There's the action of sin. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So you can see the original sin of man. It began in the mind, looking at that fruit, and then resulted in the action of taking the fruit and sinning. And the Bible says that when that happens, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. The question is, did they die that day? Well, we said they did. Now, how would we define death? Does anyone remember one word? Separation, separation right? They did die that day in the garden. They were separated from God. Now, this is uh, something that we need to understand as believers. When we sin, we are not separated from a relationship with Christ, are we? Thank the Lord for that. My son, let's, let's put it this way, if my son does something wrong, which he does several times a day, all right, you've had a two-year-old, you know, he does many things wrong, does that mean when he does something wrong, he's not my child anymore? No. Uh, even if I wanted to disown him as my son, could I do that? No. Because he's my child. See, we are called the children of God once we are saved. So once we're saved, we can never die in our relationship. We can never be separated from God from relationship with Him. But we can have death in fellowship. Okay? Separation from God in our fellowship with Him. If Gideon does something wrong, and especially last night, man, he was just banging his head on me and doing other things and he making me mad. I, I didn't feel like being next to the kid last night, to be honest with you. Uh, he was annoying me. He was doing things he shouldn't have been. Uh, fellowship wasn't the greatest at that point, okay? And uh, that, that's how it is with God. Uh, we said in Sunday school, if I regard iniquity in my heart, what will happen? The Lord will not hear me, okay? That's what sin does. God is the holy God, and therefore, when we sin, it breaks that fellowship. Just as with any other human being, if you do something wrong against them, it's going to result in broken fellowship. Now, the great thing about this is, and we've been looking at this, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, a lot of times in human relationships, when somebody does wrong by us, we hold a grudge and we hold bitterness. God says, I want to extend forgiveness to you. And uh, that's what God does. And so we understand it breaks His fellowship with Him. We do die when sin happens, but we die with our fellowship being separated from Him in that way, not relationship. We are always a child of God once we become one. But we also see here, and if you turn to the next one there, uh, natural birth is another way that we have sin. Uh, Psalm 51.5, the Bible shows us this. So if you would, take your Bibles, turn to Psalm 51. Psalm 51 and verse number 5. And due to Adam's transgression, due to his sin, we find that we are made sinners. Okay? Automatically, because we are born into sin. Since Adam sinned, all of us can trace our lineage back to uh, Adam. Did I say David? And Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So because of Adam, because of the sin of him, we are born into sin. David said it this way in Psalm 51, 5. He said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. We are conceived in that sin because of the original sin. So, as we said Sunday, if someone said, well, I've never done one thing wrong in my life, it wouldn't matter. 
if they have a father, then they're a sinner automatically. All right? And uh, so either way, we find that they are sinners and everyone has done wrong. They would have committed the sin of lie at that point, right? Uh, but we see that sin is of these things. Now, let's go ahead and go to the kinds of sin and we find a national sin, first of all, in Proverbs 14.34. Proverbs 14.34. This is a very important verse to understand, especially in the day and day in which we live. <clears throat> Proverbs 13, 14, rather, 34. It says this, Righteousness exalted a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. Righteousness exalts the nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. We see that to be in, acceptable in the eyes of God. For God to bless America as we have the bumper stickers and other things. You find those almost non-existent now. How many of you have seen the God Bless America sign lately? I haven't. Uh, I'll tell you what, it, it's been a while since I've seen that. But if God will bless America, righteousness exalteth a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. Now, I want to ask you a question tonight, and I want you to think about this with me. How is our nation going to be exalted in righteousness? Where is this going to happen? What group of people are going to bring this righteousness is it going to be at the White House? No. you think a whole lot of righteousness will be there tonight? No. I, I don't think so. Probably not. Uh, we can't expect unsaved people to act saved. And so a lot of times they're not going to make decisions based upon righteousness. Uh, how about the homosexual crowd? you think a whole lot of righteousness will come from there? No. Probably not. Uh, and how about uh, those who are atheists and agnostics and God-haters and blasphemers? You think righteousness is going to come from there? What is going to help our nation tonight is the question. What is going to exalt it? Righteousness. Where does righteousness come from? The righteous. The people of God. See, it's going to have to begin at the house of God. Judge, judgment must begin at the house of God. If you look at Titus chapter number 2, the Bible gives us great insight on us even today to help us understand how we are to live in this time. We understand we're living in sinful days. We understand that things in this nation are not what they ought to be. They aren't what they used to be, even. Immorality. And so you ask, Pastor, what are we to do at this time? Well, Titus 2 gives us the answer. And it says in Titus 2.11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. That shows us that the salvation of God, He has made it available to all men. Now, for those of us who are saved and have tasted of His goodness through salvation, we find the rest to be true. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, this is what salvation teaches us, and the grace of God, that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. See, in this present world, you say, well, does that just mean the days of Titus? No, in this present age, as we speak, we can live godly. We can live righteously, although all that is there. Uh, you see, what's the motivation? Well, the Bible says, looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. See, Jesus is coming again, so that is motivation for us to live holy, to live righteously. See, we need people who will live righteously. You say, well, Pastor, the White House is just horrible. Barack Obama is horrible. Uh, all of these politicians are horrible. The Supreme Court uh, uh, are just uh, ungodly and unrighteous. And we understand all these things, but... We need to live righteously. 
See, it's not that the White House is going to make good decisions that will exalt a nation. God says it's righteousness that exalted the nation. Here's my question. Is God's people living in a righteous way? They're not. They're pointing to all these other places and saying, well, it's this group and it's this crowd and it's this politician. Why we're in the mess we're in and it's us to blame. Because it's righteousness that exalted the nation. The only people that can be righteous in the eyes of God are the ones who have Jesus' blood shed on their account. And that those who are righteous can produce that righteousness. You look at 2 Chronicles 7.14. We know this verse. It says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. See, it says, If my people, which are called by my name. You understand, it's God's people that He is speaking of. It's God's people that will start reviving. God's people, if uh, things are going to turn around in this nation, we're going to have to start taking a stand for some things. That means we're going to have to stop living like the world. We're going to have to stop living wickedly. We're going to have to start living righteously and change some things in our life. Matthew 5.16 puts it this way. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and do what? And glorify your Father which is in heaven. A lot of us, our light is burned out. A lot of us, our light is under a bushel. People can't see our light. It's non-existent. There's not a whole lot of light in this darkness today, like there ought to be. When you live differently, people are going to take notice, and they are going to see your light. Oh, if we would do what Romans 13, 11 says, I want you to turn there. This is a great challenge to us tonight. Romans 13, 11. May we all just take this verse and personalize it in our lives. Romans 13, 11. It says, and that knowing the time. Do you know the time we're in? Do you know how wicked it is right now? You know how the time is right now? Then take the following into account. That now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation or our glorification and time on this earth nearer than when we believe. It's high time to awake out of sleep. You know, a lot of people are sleeping spiritually tonight. I'm not saying that they are dead in the sense that they aren't saved. I'm saying that they are asleep to righteousness in their life. They're asleep to what the Word of God says. They say, well, I'm doing better than the guy next to me, and I'm not as bad as him, so I'm doing all right. Hey, our standard, as we said, has to be the Word of God. If we are going to live righteously, if we're going to see our nation exalted, we're going to have to get back to the book. We're going to have to live righteously according to the righteous standard. And so we see that there is national sin, but there is a cure to national sin found in the Christians. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. But then we see secondly here, personal sin in Joshua 7.20. So personal sin in Joshua 7.20. Joshua 7 20 it says and Achan answered Joshua and said indeed and here's the important word of our verse I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel and thus and thus have I done you can see it was a personal sin that Achan had committed in the camp in uh, taking the stuff he should not have but we also see here personal sin and secret sin is the next one that's found in Psalm chapter number 90. Psalm 90. Psalm 90. 
Psalm 90 and verse number 8. Psalm 90 and verse 8 says, Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. The secret sin, sins that we think no one else knows about, but God knows what is an omniscient God. That means that God is all what? Knowing, right? Science, conscience with knowledge. So God has all knowledge. Hebrews 4 and verse 13 tells us this about God. It says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. All things are open and naked, naked with God. See, God sees all. He hears all. He knows all. He doesn't only know the outside, He knows the inside as well. And He knows the condition of your heart. He knows those sins that no one else knows about. He knows the sins that not even your spouse knows about. Uh, he, he knows those things, those thoughts that go through your mind. God knows all those things. And so those are our secret sins in the sense to man, but they are no secret with God. You look also here in Psalm 19, Psalm 19, and we'll actually get to this uh, text when we get to our next point here. But Psalm 19 shows us secret sins as well. As you turn there, I want you to think of this verse. The Bible says in Proverbs, Whoso covereth his sin shall not what? Prosper. If you cover your sins, if you try to have secret sins, you're not going to prosper. And uh, we will see how that uh, later on in this study, whoso confesseth and forsaketh shall have mercy. But when we cover our sins, when we try to have those secret sins, we are not going to be blessed of God. Psalm 19, and we see this in verse number 12, the Bible says, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. And uh, how important it is to make sure we get those sins right with God. You say, well, no one else knows about my sin, Pastor. Well, no one knew about Jonah's sins, did they? They found out real quick what was going on. And uh, there's going to be some things in your life, if you keep that secret sin, it's going to come out. Achan, he was mistaken, wasn't he? Uh, you find he was later stoned to death for what he did and his family. Secret sin, be sure your sin will do what? It'll find you out. And so it's important that we get those sins taken care of. But also we see here presumptuous sins are the next one. Presumptuous sins. We look down to the next verse, verse number 13. And David says this. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and shall be innocent from the great transgression. You say, well, what's presumptuous sins, Pastor? I have a definition up here for you, a very simple one. You are fully aware that you are doing wrong. Fully aware that he or she is sinning. That's presumptuous sins. You know you're doing wrong when you're doing it and even before you're doing it. Now, to give you an example of this, and I'm picking on my son tonight. He's actually doing halfway good tonight. But uh, 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 a kid, think about this with me. A kid a lot of times will know they're doing wrong before they commit the wrong. My son, what he likes to do, is he likes to get dog food. And he likes to eat it. Okay, I, I don't know why, but uh, we have Old Roy. And my dad always said Old Roy is made up of Old Roy. Just round up but, uh, the bad stuff. But Gideon likes that stuff, and I don't know why, but he does. And so what he'll do a lot of times, if he knows we're around, he'll kind of look around, and then he'll walk real quietly, make no noise. You can't hear a thing. When the two-year-old is around and they're not making noise, there's a problem, isn't there? You better check up on them. 
And uh, so uh, we see him, and he has his hands full of dog food. What he does is he's so innocent right now, as we're trying to run after him and give him a spanking, uh, he's going to take that dog food and chuck it back in the bowl like nothing happened. That's his mindset. And uh, he knows. You say, well, he's a two-year-old. Does he know he's doing wrong? He does. Because he's looking around and seeing... Where are they at? Can I get away from it? Can Daddy not run after me that fast? Which I normally can't. And uh, he's just strategic in that way. That's how kids are. That's presumptuous sins in our life. You know, sometimes in life we have sins, and a lot of times it has to do with lust, okay? Lust of the flesh, what we're talking about with presumptuous sins. Because we know it's wrong to do it, but our flesh says, I need it. You ever been there before? It's wrong to do it, but your flesh says, you really need that. It's kind of like Mountain Dew. Pastor, you really need that. And then I say, okay. And the presumptuous sin. No, uh, it's not bad every now and then. Uh, or it might be. We'll stay off that. But uh, presumptuous sins. You know it's wrong to do, but your flesh craves it. And you give in. And what do you feel like after you do it? You feel rotten, don't you? I've been there before. Uh, I'll tell you what, as, uh, as a young college student, the things that you struggle with in the mind as a man, that's, that's a difficult thing, isn't it? And uh, so a lot of times afterwards you just feel rotten for what you have done. That's what presumptuous sins are. Those are sins that we struggle with all the time, and we give in all the time. We're fully aware of what's going to happen, and we give in anyway. You say, well, pastor, how do we get victory over that? I mean, I struggle with this. I know it's wrong, but I keep doing it anyway. Look to the Apostle Paul. He said, the things I would, that do I not. The things that I would not, that I do. O wretched man that I am. It goes all the way back to what we looked at in the first lesson. There is a battle between flesh and spirit. And uh, I don't want to sound like a broken record player almost every single Wednesday we talk about this. But the way you're going to defeat sin is living the Spirit-filled life. The reason you're falling into these tendencies of presumptuous sins is because you're walking in the flesh. See, the Bible tells us, walk in the Spirit that you may not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Right? If we would walk in the Spirit, we wouldn't have a desire for the flesh. We would have a desire for God and righteousness. And so when we find our minds at that moment wanting sin and wanting fleshly tendencies, we must kill it and we must ask God for forgiveness and we must ask to be filled with the Spirit at that moment. Because if we don't, we're going to fall into sin. And there's no uh, knowing where that sin is going to take us. So we see the reason is because of our flesh. Now, we understand we need to walk in the Spirit of God. But I want you to notice another cure for presumptuous sins that's actually found in this chapter. As you look at the whole context of this chapter, you're going to notice it talks about Almighty God. Look at verses 1 through 6. You see God there described as Creator. Right? Right? The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day by day uttereth speech, and night by night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where his voice is not heard. And uh, you, you can go on and see those verses. Then verses 7 through 11, it starts out saying what? The law of the Lord, right, is perfect. Converting the soul. The testimonies of the Lord are sure. Making wise is simple. Uh, the statutes of the Lord are just. And so forth and so on. So what are we getting at? First six verses we see is dealing with general revelation. Now this is way back. Okay? General revelation, there's two types. Does anyone remember? <coughs> Creation and conscience. Remember that? That's way back when. Creation, that's what we're talking about in the first six verses, right? We are seeing God in general revelation. Verse number seven, special revelation. What's one thing that we see in this text that shows special revelation? The Bible, right? The Word of God. And so you can see that what David did was he dwelled on God. We should make God our meditation. 
You know, if we would dwell on God each and every moment, we wouldn't fall into sin. Could you imagine if we thought about God 24-7, all of our thoughts only thought about God, we wouldn't fall into sin, would we? Now that's a hard thing to do, okay? 24-7, your mind only on God, because we do have a flesh. But that should be our goal. Uh, as we've said in Colossians 3, it says to set our affection on things above. That means to be mentally disposed. Taking your mind and putting that only on God and godliness and righteousness. And uh, when we do that, you're going to find you don't fall into these presumptuous sins. When you meditate on God and when you walk in the Spirit, you will have victory over presumptuous sins. And so I challenge you, if you're struggling with those things, I understand the struggle is real with that. Alright? And it is a difficult thing to overcome a presumptuous sin. But it is possible. I promise you that. And so I challenge you to meditate and to walk in the Spirit as well. But we also see open sin is found in the kinds of sin as well. This is in 1 Timothy chapter number 5. 1 Timothy chapter number 5. I'm not going to spend a long time on this, so if you want to, you can turn to Isaiah 3, and uh, we'll, uh, these are almost synonymous in a way. Um, so Isaiah 3, if you want to turn there, I'll read to you 1 Timothy 5 and verse 24. It says, Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before the judgment, and some men they follow after. So open sin. Okay, sin that can be easily seen. It's right there, everyone knows about it. This goes along with shameless. Okay, this is going to be ten steps above that. All right, sometimes there's open sin in the sense that uh, I don't want to say it's not bad sin, but it's not being blatant against God. Okay, how many of you sin when you sin, you do it blatantly against God? You intend to. No, I, I would say if we're believers and we have a conscience, we're in the house of God, we probably don't sin blatantly against God desiring to make Him mad. Okay? Uh, that's not uh, what we're talking about. So open sin, we're going to take that up about ten notches, okay? And uh, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter number three, and we're going to see shameless sin. So Isaiah in chapter number three and verse number nine the Bible says this. The show of their countenance doth witness against them. They declare their sin is Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. They hide not their sin. Now that sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? That's almost scary. It's almost like a prophecy of where we are today. People are not afraid to hide their sin. But people are afraid to be righteous. People are afraid to show that they love the Lord. So you can see that there is a difference here, that they are blatant against their sin. They are like the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, where people were just blatantly in this sin. Now, I want you to look at Jeremiah chapter number 6, and we're going to close for tonight. Jeremiah 6, and this is a very important verse. Because this is speaking of supposedly the people of God. Jeremiah 6 and verse 15. The prophets were prophesying falsely. The people were living wickedly. They were just playing church, if you would. So Jeremiah 6, 15, the Bible tells us this. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? How many of you, when you sin, you feel dirty almost from it? You should. If you can sin and not feel dirty about it, there's something wrong. You have a seared conscience. Uh, if you say, well, pastor, I sin and I just feel horrible afterwards, I do it all the time. Hey, at least you have a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit of God. If you can sin and you say it doesn't affect me, you have some major problems. You're like, like these people here. When they committed abomination, were they, uh, did they feel ashamed? The Bible says nay. They were not at all ashamed. 
neither could they blush. That's an amazing statement. You know what we've lost in America today? We've lost our blush. Used to be you could see things and it would just make your face turn red. Right? Uh, bathing suits back then are a lot different than they are today. You go to a beach today, I'll tell you what, don't go to a beach today because it's not good. Uh, my wife and I, we only went to the beach, I think, four times while we were living in Florida for two years. It wasn't because of that. Uh, that had to do with part of it. We would always go in the freezing cold. And uh, it would get cold in Florida, about 60 degrees. And uh, so uh, that's when you went to the beach, all right? And uh, no, uh, uh, I'll tell you what, there's a lot of wickedness today. And we have lost our blush as people of God. We can sit through a television program or even a movie, and it can cuss every other phrase, and we're fine with it. We're not sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God anymore. We're sensitive to the things of the world. Uh, we have no stances. You say, well, church takes too many stances. We need to just have grace with all people. Now, I understand that we need to shed grace to people, but we need to take stands on certain things and against certain things. I've mentioned the homosexuals. You say, Pastor, do you agree with them? No, I don't. Why don't you agree with them? Because of the Bible and what it says. That's why I don't agree with them. It isn't that I don't hate them. It's that the Bible condemns their lifestyle. Do you agree with drinking? No, I don't. I don't agree with it at all. Uh, should you drink a little wine for the stomach's sake? No, I don't believe you should. I think if you drink grape juice, you'd find the same effects for it. And uh, that's uh, clinically proven, if you would. All right? I, I, I don't agree uh, with certain things that people do because the Bible condemns that lifestyle. It's about time we as Christians get our blush back. If we can stand there while a co-worker cusses and does perversity for minutes or even hours at a time, there's something wrong. Say, well, what am I to do? If they come and cuss or tell dirty jokes or put perversity around me, tell them to stop it. You say, well, that's awkward. Righteousness exalted the nation. The sin is a reproach to any people. See, it's time to take a stand against some sin. It's time to stand up for the righteousness of God. I've had several occasions where people are saying dirty things and wicked things. I told them to knock it off because I don't want to hear it. Just tell them. Be bold. I tell them I don't want to hear that stuff. I don't want to defile my ears with that. Could you imagine today, and to put it in perspective, if you had a co-worker that was homosexual, and let's say that people were bashing them. And I'm not saying you should do that. If you do that, you're sinning against God. You shouldn't bash them. But let's say that you, you have people who are talking about it against them and saying things they ought not to against them. What is that person going to do to the administration? They're going to talk to them about those people. They're going to probably get thrown in prison for hate speech because they were defiling them. Why can't we as the people of God take a stand against wickedness? Why can't we say, hey, this is against my standard, and I'm standing up? You say, well, that's difficult. Hey, do you want to live righteously? Do you want to get your blush back? You say, well, it's just another day. Hey, it shouldn't be. People should know you don't put up with it because you're a Christian. You ought not to take part of that even. You ought to be separate, saith the Lord. Whatever it takes to get your blush back, do it. Could mean that tonight you need to go through your DVDs and chuck them out. Could be you need to take that DVR and take it to a different channel instead and maybe even get rid of the DVR altogether. I don't know what you need to do, but it could be dramatic. But we need to get our blush back as a nation. We need to live righteously. You say, well, Pastor, that's just, that's just old-fashioned. Hey, the old-fashioned days were a lot better than they are today, aren't they? Because people lived like they should have. So we need to get back to that as well. So that's my challenge to you tonight. I challenge you to live righteously. I know that's kind of different preaching than what I normally do, but that's preaching that we need. We need to live righteously and godly in this present world because things are never going to change unless the people of God wake up. So that's my challenge tonight.
Brother Lyle, would you dismiss us in prayer tonight? Father, we thank you for this day you've given us. Lord, we thank you for this time to uh, study thy word and, Lord, to uh, learn from your word.